from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Sarah Foss and I'm joined today by Buzzy Cohen. Happy spooky season, Sarah. That's right. It's coming. We are just days <laughs> away from Halloween, eight days to be exact, yep. and I can feel mm-hmm. it's building. Yep. Bubbling. We've already had a few submissions yep. for our Deathly Double competition. Don't forget, get in those costumes. Yes. We want to see them. Yes. Be creative. Be exciting. Surprise me. Delight me. I'm not the only one. It's a double blind committee who decides who the winner is like everything at jeopardy we hold it to the utmost standards of fairness and propriety but we want to see the amazing creativity that you all in the community have yes and again not that we don't love to see anyone's costumes but if you can find a way to incorporate the world of jeopardy into your costume i mean even better for example last year's winner was dressed as Johnny Gilbert Reads Rap Lyrics. So it was a classic Johnny. They had a wig that looked like Johnny. They had uh, the satin jacket of Johnny, but then they had the chain and, you know, a little bit of that bling. It brought uh, it. It really brought it. Super fun. Bring it. Bring it. You have until October 31st to post your costumes to be eligible for the grand prize (laughs) photograph of Ken Jennings signed by Buzzy Cohen. Yes, and we will be potting with our costumes next week. So get ready for that. I mean, I don't know if we can top last year, but we're going to try. Last year was fun. We'll try. We also just, I mean, if we sound a little breathless, it's because we just ran from the Alex Trebek stage to record this pod. That is true. We are in the middle of another exciting Champions Wild Card competition. And we're now at the clubs, Buzzy. Okay. Now, in Jeopardy airtime, yes. we have wrapped up the spades and started the diamonds. But in Jeopardy production time, we are really catching fire in the clubs. I always catch fire in the club. <laughs> and then we have the hearts remaining. So oh, yes. I know everyone is like, how can I keep track? But this is what we're doing. We have a website. Four Champions Wild Card <laughs> competitions. There is a website. It's all laid out. These are all season 37 and season 38 champions. Four suits, the spade, the diamond, the clubs, the hearts. You're going to see them all. And yes, it was a really great taping day today. I can't wait for people to see these episodes live. But right now, all the buzz. Yes. Always about you, Buzz Buzz. But Mm. all the buzz (laughs) is about Josh Sack. Yes. He is the winner of our first ever Champions Wildcard. And as promised, Buzzy and I will be speaking with him later in the pod, talking about his return, what it means to be the first to hold this new title that we've come up with, and what he's going to do to prepare for the Tournament of Champions, because that's what you get. Yes. In addition to that $100,000 prize, you get a fast pass to the TOC. (laughs) And this is something that these Season 37 and Season 38 players never anticipated would come their way. So really excited to talk with him. We're also going to be highlighting last week's Celebrity Jeopardy in primetime and this past week's games in syndication. So a lot to get to. But first, as always, we're going to take a quick look back at this week in Jeopardy history. This is Celebrity Jeopardy. Now entering the studio are today's celebrity contestants, the co-host of Television's Live with Regis and Kathy Lee, Regis Tilden. Abby in the long-running Knott's Landing and the star of the TV movie The President's Child, Donna Mills. And actress, comedian, star of stage, screen, and television, Carol Burnett. And now, here is the host of Jeopardy, Alex Trebek. Thank you, Johnny Gilbert. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Jeopardy. Welcome, stars. How do you feel today? Uh Strong, Alex. Strong. Nervous. Good. (laughs) This is something I have been looking forward to for eight years, and at long last, we have a celebrity Jeopardy. And in answer to a question many of you people are probably thinking about right now, the answer is no. The celebrities have not been briefed. In fact, they do not know what the categories are. So they have not been told what subjects to study for their appearance here today. They are here, as are all of our contestants, with their intelligence, their reflexes, and their egos completely exposed. It's all on the line. So for that, our thanks and our admiration. We'll get into the game in just a second. 
The stars are playing for their favorite charities, and to add an extra element of competition, the celebrity who has the highest total for the week will have that sum matched by the Jeopardy! program and sent along to the charity. Hard to believe, 31 years ago this week, Celebrity Jeopardy! debuted in syndication. It was a little different back in 1992. It was a, a week-long tournament where 15 celebrities battled it out. And as you heard Alex mention, the celebrity with the highest total for the week was the one who was crowned the champion. You also heard Alex introduce our celebrities who were competing in that first game, Regis Feldman, Donna Mills, and Carol Burnett. What a lineup. Yeah. Funny enough, it also happened to be this week that Steven Weber competed in his mm. first Celebrity Jeopardy game against Cheech Marin and Alan Rakins. Of course, Steven has returned to the Alex Trebek stage just last week. You saw him go up against Shane Battier and Melissa Fumero. We're going to discuss that game later in the pod, but we had recently kind of taken a look back to the early days of Celebrity Jeopardy when we played that clip in Steven's show, and I think all of us just remarked on how different everything looks, but yet how the game remains the same. Yeah, you know, this is something for those of our listeners who also listen to the This Is Jeopardy podcast. We did an entire episode on Celebrity Jeopardy and got to talk about how this even came about. If you enjoyed that clip, hop on over to the This Is Jeopardy page and you can hear a little bit more about Celebrity Jeopardy through the years and to think about how the SNL sketches came to be as a result of those early days of Celebrity Jeopardy. And glad to know that it is still continuing on in primetime right now on ABC. But right now we're going to head into the game highlights. We kicked off the week with our second semifinal, Josh Sack, Kendra Blanchett, Dane Rygard. This was an exciting way to start the week. Dane and Kendra were neck and neck early on, Josh trailing behind, but all three players battled their way through double jeopardy, finishing the round within $4,200 of each other. Although Dane had a small lead heading into final, Josh was the only one to come up with the correct response. Buzzy, the trend continues. Yes capping off an impressive come-from-behind win, securing his spot in the finals, joining Sam Stapleton, who had punched his ticket to the finals the week prior. Whew. What a what game. game. I got to shout out Josh for running the You Do the Math category. That'll never happen to me. So mazel tov, Josh. Well, and a lot of discussion about yes. Titnochtitlan. And this was one of those, you know, we went back. We listened. We mm -hmm. deliberated. It's a tough break. We can understand why our players might pronounce that name wrong, but the briefing is very clear. You either have to pronounce the word correctly or phonetically correctly, and unfortunately, that didn't happen in this case. Yes. Had someone said Tinoctitlan, even though it's not the way we pronounce it, it would be phonetically correct, and that would have been acceptable. Yeah. So this was a tough break, but certainly something that the judges reviewed and tried to deliberate on until we knew that we had the right call on that one. But clearly, it didn't stop Josh from winning the game. So it was a ruling that was tough to make, but Josh goes on to the finals. Moving on to Tuesday for our third semifinal game with Joe Feldman, Daniel Nguyen, and Lucy Ricketts. This was a close Jeopardy round. All three players within just $400 of each other. But Lucy started to pull away in double Jeopardy, working towards a runaway heading into final that's her second runaway in this competition. She was the only player who was able to come up with the correct response in Final Jeopardy. So just put a little exclamation point on that win. And Lucy rounds up our competition for the finals. I have to say, having a runaway after losing $8,400 in daily doubles, very impressive. And if she's listening to the podcast and knowing these statistics where only one person is getting final correct in this competition, you certainly want to be in a runaway when yes. you're heading <laughs> to final. It really, really helps that situation. Heading into Wednesday, where we kicked off the two-day total point of fair. Whoop, we whoop, love whoop, to whoop, say whoop. it, Buzzy. With Sam, Lucy, and Josh, all three players nearly even after the Jeopardy round, but Josh slowly starting to pull away in double Jeopardy. Sam and Lucy began to close the gap, but Josh headed into final with a $16,600 total and the lead. All three players, Buzzy. Correct in final, the streak is broken for this week. But with Josh's big wager, he was able to take a $10,000 lead heading into day two. 
I like Josh's big play on the first final. I think a lot of people talk about treating the first final of a two-day total point affair almost like a daily double that everyone plays. And the same way that you might bet big on a daily double, of course, you have a little less information, but I uh, I really, really like that wager. And it puts him in a really good spot going into the second game. He's got a little bit of breathing room. Well, we always know anything can happen, but on day two, the Thursday show, Sam, Josh, and Lucy returned. They all kept up that strong gameplay in the Jeopardy round neck and neck until Josh hit the first daily double in double Jeopardy and wagered $7,200. So that really just bounced him into a position that yeah. allowed him to have a two-day runaway score before we ever got into final. That means he went into final Jeopardy, maybe not consciously knowing, but we knew at home he was headed to the Tournament of Champions. Yeah, I think uh, this was a great game. I think all three of these players played these finals very, very well. And I think Josh just had a little bit of that eye of the tiger really pushing. We're going to talk to him in a little bit, so I don't want to you know, get too far ahead of myself. But I, th- I hope Sam and Lucy feel good about their performance because they both played really, really well. And Sam gave us a little comedic relief in Final Jeopardy. What happens if Josh pulls a Cliff Clavin? <laughs> I mean, at that point, that's what Sam's hoping for. And Josh, he had that runaway game, so he was allowed to put what is Regan as his Final Jeopardy response. That, of course, his daughter's name. He and I share a similarity there. I have a Reagan. He has a Regan. And um, my daughter will probably never get to see that moment. But Josh's daughter <laughs> did, and he is headed to the TOC. Ken had a chance to catch up with Josh right after the game. Let's take a listen to see how he was feeling after claiming a $100,000 prize. You just won $100,000. I, I, yeah. What are you going to do now? (laughs) I'm not usually speechless, so this is weird. Um, Pretty awesome. And I've said this the entire week about how, you know, certainly it's easy for me to say now, but money was secondary to having this full experience here with, you know, I've seen a bunch of our folks in the audience. Hey, you know, that's this great. Week, that that has been. I mean, I I'm. This is a dream. So and you're you're returning the money. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that. My daughter needs to go to college. Congratulations, Josh. Well done, all three of you, taking home those big cash prizes. Really enjoyed our first ever Champions Wildcard. You folks made it special. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. All right, there you have it. Congratulations to Josh on becoming our first ever Champions Wildcard winner. We're going to talk with Josh later in the show, but for now, we're moving on to Friday's game, where we introduced our first group of returning champions in the Diamonds Group, Buzzy. Diamonds are forever. Diamonds in the sky. (laughs) All right, starting off with Dave Pye, William Chu, and Kristen Husek. Both Kristen and Dave played their original games with Alex as host back in Season 37, and William had played his original game with Ken as his host during season 38. Interestingly enough, Kristen's fourth game, her losing game, aired on 10-20-2020, and of course this game aired on the third (laughs) anniversary of that game, so I don't know how she was feeling as she headed into that game. I think she had an eye for redemption. There we go. Well, Kristen (laughs) and Dave battled through the entire game with the lead changing multiple times. It came down to the wire with Dave taking a slight lead heading into final, and he was able to come up with the correct response, becoming our first semifinalist of the Diamonds Group. Yeah, tough break for Kristen uh, missing on that final, but obviously, even if she had gotten it right, even if she had bet it all, uh, Dave with that edge. Dave really dominating the buzzer. I think that's something important to look at as he progresses through this 62% buzzer percentage. That is much higher than you know our average winner who's in the 55%, so Dave's one to watch. Well, and I think we've just enjoyed this level of competition. Be it the spades, be it the diamonds, we're seeing a really high level of gameplay in these games. That's what happens when you bring back a bunch of champions. You know that you're bringing back people who know how to play and know how to win on the Alex Trebek stage. All right, we head now back to Wednesday night in primetime where our fourth Celebrity Jeopardy quarterfinal game aired with Steven Weber, Shane Battier, and Melissa Fumero. As we mentioned, Steven first played back in 1992, our third game ever of Celebrity Jeopardy. He came in second behind Cheech Marin, who Who won. Who won, yes, the whole thing. (laughs) And, you know, Steven talked about how he didn't necessarily go in thinking that Cheech was 
the commanding Jeopardy player. <laughs> I don't think anyone did, but, you know, I think we talk on This is Jeopardy. We talked with Cheech about how his appearance on Jeopardy really changed how people saw him. This show is changing lives, not just of our everyday contestants, but also these celebrity contestants. People see them in a new light. Yeah, and Cheech would come on Regularly. subsequent times yeah. on the show and continue to do very, very well. In this game, it was Stephen and Shane who were battling it out throughout the Jeopardy round, but then Stephen started to pull away in double Jeopardy. He took a strong lead into triple Jeopardy. Don't forget we have that round <laughs> in Celebrity Jeopardy, where he continued to dominate, fighting all three daily doubles and wagering huge amounts in each of them. 11,400, 10,000, and 15,000. Now, despite missing that last $15,000 daily double, he still maintained the lead heading into final. Both Stephen and Shane were correct, but Stephen had already locked up that win with an impressive runaway, and he's headed to the semifinals. Stephen, that was a great game. If you're listening to this, I'm sure you are. That was a great game. I'm not mad at that $15,000 miss, especially when you're dominating like that. Great buzzer percentage. Um, and the one thing I really want to call out is that your correct percentage, very high. That shows a high confidence in your knowledge and playing it right. Shane actually, with a higher buzzer percentage at 63%, but a lower correct percentage, and that really hurt him. Obviously, Steven finding those three daily doubles puts him in control of a lot of money in this game, but Shane also played well. Maybe a little bit less guessing, and Shane would be our champion. Well, and Steven also proved that he really knows how to respond like a pirate. <laughs> In that category, whether it be Arby's, the Arctic, archaeology, and then even as we went into other categories, he was still pulling it out. So uh, that was fun. Fun was had by all in Celebrity Jeopardy as it always is. And now it's time for this week's host chat. An audience member asked Ken, you have to pronounce so many difficult words. How do you do it and make it look so easy? Well, I'm very bright. <laughs> No, uh, in fact, you know, Alex used to come in early every morning and spend a couple hours with the games. You know, he'd come in at 6 a.m. and he'd mark up the script and he'd have a dictionary. And I go through the whole process as well, except I am not a, an 80-year-old greatest generation Canadian man. Uh, I do not want to get up at 6 a.m. To, to play with a dictionary, so I tend to do it the night before. So last night I looked at all of today's games. The researchers helped me mark up pronunciations. I did my own stuff. And then in the morning, there's a meeting where we go over every clue and, you know, how do you want to say this? What if the contestant says that? Is it confusing if we do it in this order? You know, where do the daily doubles go? We kick the tires on every clue every morning. And this is a question Alex yes. would often get asked. How many languages do you speak? Yeah. Oh, I speak many tongues. <laughs> yes. One thing I will say is that the writing and production team are incredibly helpful to, to all of us who have had to say things on TV. Absolutely. They do wonderful little grammatical marks <laughs> to make sure that you know the correct pronunciation. And like Alex did, you know, coming in every day at 6 a.m., Ken doesn't do it in the morning. He stays late in the evening, but he puts in the time, he puts in the work to mm -hmm. make sure that he's really familiar with those games and in particular really familiar with how to say things correctly. And it really shows. It really yes. shows. I have a question for you, Sarah. Did yes. the Clue Crew have the benefit of that expertise when you're out on the road if you're shooting at dawn at the pyramids of giza did you have someone there who could help you with these pronunciations well interestingly enough we would often get references before we left because mm. our clues had all been written and researched primarily unless we came across something <laughs> so they would give us you know various phonetic pronunciations but i will tell you there are many an occasion i can recall picking up the phone and calling Billy Weiss, <laughs> one of our co-head writers. He is known, when we're on a Clue Crew shoot, he'll answer the phone at any hour, at any time. You can count on Billy to take your call. And there were times where, you know, I was saying something in a foreign language. Maybe we were going to ad-lib a little mm -hmm. something and, you know, do some sort of introduction in another language. You kind of overthink it because maybe your local guide is, is saying it one way. And right. so Billy was always there to answer my call, answer my questions, and make sure that I that I came across sounding much better as than brilliant I, as you are. As brilliant as I am. Yeah. Yes, that's just, what I was going to say. The brilliance lives inside you. It's just making sure that it gets expressed. Yeah. We have a great team for that at Jeopardy. I, I like that very much. Yeah. All right, well, now it is time. We're going to welcome back to the pod Josh Sack, our first ever Champions Wildcard winner. Welcome, Josh. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Sarah. I appreciate it. So take us back. It's July 2021, your first appearance on the Jeopardy stage at that point. Talk me through that, that first 
that first win, that first time being out here in Los Angeles? I, I think like pretty much anybody who's invited to play Jeopardy, I think it's, first of all, just an honor to, to be asked and to be on that stage to win a game is like you know the cherry on top but to win three games is is more than i could have ever possibly expected and you're kind of hitting a stride you know we always talk about people after that third win they change a bit do you notice that buzzy it's like the third game win it's like something changes so you've kind of hit that stride you come into a game and there's this guy mad emodio but I really want to talk about the fact that this was not the Emodio Rodeo that we would right. come to see in later games. You guys were really, really neck and neck throughout the game. You're only down by $400 to Matt in final, and you're both correct. So, I mean, this really could have been anyone's game. What was it like in that moment, and then what was it like to to know the run that then went on for Matt? Well, I think, you know, when I first met Matt, I thought, you know, he was a super nice guy. I really enjoyed meeting him and getting to know him. I could tell just by talking to them, I thought he's going to be a tough competitor. And sure enough, we got to our game. We're neck and neck. I lost it on that last one. And it's one of those things where I could probably look at that clue nine times out of 10. I'm going to get it right because I, I know who Andrew Lloyd Webber is. I just completely blanked. And it was unfortunate that it happened to put me $400 behind him going into final. And I pretty much knew at that point, given the category, that he was going to go pretty much all in. And I was just covering to make sure that I could get at least to, to second. I have a question, not to jump too far ahead. You played four games, some with George Stephanopoulos, some with mm-hmm. Robin Roberts. Now you've played with Ken. What's it like playing with these different hosts? Oh, I, I like to say that George was a great host. You can certainly tell he's got the news chops. He, he knew how to move a game along. Robin was fantastic. I really enjoyed her. She's got just this great aura, a great personality, and just so friendly. I will say that I, I was a little disappointed that in the game that I lost, she asked me right before the show started taping, or actually it had started taping, <laughs> she asked if I was her good luck charm. And I had mm. to, of course, say yes. And I'll, I'll never quite forget it. Um, you know, I can't <laughs> I can't necessarily put the two and two together. But that was the game I lost. So there's a little bit of sour grapes. But they're both fantastic. And now Ken. I mean, Ken was great. Ken has been a contestant for, you know, 100 plus games now. You could tell that he wants the players to succeed. And it's great to know that he is, he is pretty much one of us. So how long had you been contemplating taking the test, trying to get on Jeopardy. Tell me a little bit about your Jeopardy journey. Well, I can recall coming home, you know, as a junior high student in the late 1980s to my grandma's house uh, to watch the show with her in, in Chicago. It was and still is on at 3.30. So that coincides right with when school releases. So I have distinct memories of watching the show with her. It wasn't until about 2010, 2011 that I took the test for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting an, an interview, an in-person interview, I think in Portland, Uh, having gone, was unsuccessful, tried again. I think I ended up trying four or five times. And ultimately, with the Zoom interviews was when I was successful in late 2020. So it's been a long time. It's been a long time coming. But But not an uncommon story from great players, you know? If at first you don't succeed, try, try again to get on Jeopardy. Absolutely. So you leave that day a three-game champion. What goes through your mind, you know, with the Tournament of Champions approaching? What would the cut be? Would you make it? What's your thought process as those continuing months went on? Oh, I remember having a conversation after my three-game stint with one of the contestant coordinators and say, you know, kind of asking, you know, truthfully knowing the answer that my chances are, are slim to none. And that was fine by me. I had a great time. You know, if that was the end of my Jeopardy journey, then I was satisfied in the outcome, even if it perhaps could have been more losing by just a hair. But I was certainly satisfied with being as successful as I was. So one thing that happens is that you finish up the tape day and then you're done. You go home. What was it like to see Matt, who beat you, you discovered kind of with the rest of us about his run? I'll be honest. I I knew he'd do well. I didn't (laughs) know that he would win 38 times. Uh, So I think it was fantastic to see a success because I know Matt's an absolutely brilliant guy. And I was really very happy for him. But certainly I wasn't expecting 38 times. I I don't know if anybody was. So then you come to hear a big announcement for contestants who played in season 39. We're going to have a champion's wild card. You know, anyone who's won at least one game is going to get a chance to come back. Those who played in season 39 and you're thinking, hey, what about season 37? Was there any, gosh, 
I wish I could have another chance, or I certainly wish that was my opportunity. Sarah, I honestly know I had no inclination whatsoever that they would invite contestants back from previous seasons. I thought my time was was done. I had a great time. There was nothing even in the back of my mind that I would get another opportunity. So what's it like when you do get yeah. the call, when it's happening? Oh, boy. I remember uh, sitting down at lunch with one of my, my former supervisor at work. And I remember getting this, uh, you know, looking at my phone. I don't want to be rude. But I looked and I saw it was Los Angeles. And I thought, well, I don't know anybody in Los Angeles. And I think that's consistent with whatever everybody else has said. But I will say in the back of my mind, I saw the Los Angeles and I thought, well, there's a small potential that I do know somebody in Los Angeles. And sure enough, I checked the transcript, checked the voice message, and it was an invite back for something called this Champions Wild Card. And I hadn't heard that that Jeopardy was going to do this. I honestly thought it was, you know, half a joke, half serious. But sure enough, it was serious and uh, gave them a call back, discussed the details. And, you know, here we are. Well, what do you do after that moment? You're coming back. What do you do to prepare? Sarah, I don't know if there's anything you can do to prepare uh, <laughs> for this. I was only given a, a couple of weeks of notice. So, I mean, certainly the, the J Archive is a huge resource. I was fortunate enough to do a couple of mock games with a couple of folks locally, looking at some of previous Final Jeopardy, shoring up some of the, the areas that I'm probably not strongest in. But with that limited time available, you kind of just do your best to, you know, keep, keep taking as many quizzes, looking, being curious, uh, looking at uh, current events, making as many connections as you can to what you know and sort of what the clues ultimately say. And I don't want to say I heard you took a page out of my book, but we borrowed the same book from the library of getting into <laughs> physical shape to prepare for the Jeopardy appearance. Want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, Buzzy, I, I always like to take a page out of, out of your book. Absolutely. <laughs> One of the things I did uh, was one of my shows in the quarterfinal was we've got a workout group that meets uh, first thing in the morning. And when I say first thing in the morning, it's about it's, it's just before 6 a.m. And we spend time doing various workouts. And sometimes they will use old Jeopardy boards to incentivize you know, kind of the learning process, if you will. If you get something mm. wrong, you have to do that equivalent in push ups, sit ups, pull ups, what have you. So it's a good way to kind of keep your mind and body fresh, if you will. I like this. I want to see those boards. I want to live that. I'm going to come out and visit and train with you guys. He's always up to train, this yeah. guy. <laughs> so I have to know, obviously, coming into this competition, you were one of the names when we first announced the competition that people thought, if only there was a competition where Josh Sack could come back. Oh, wait, there is. But what was it like kind of sizing up the other competition within your group and seeing, you know, what other champions you had maybe anticipated seeing or when you saw them, you were like, oh, no, this is going to be tough. Just tell me about the camaraderie of that group when you first gathered. Oh, I, I tell you, one of the best parts, if not the best part about getting a chance to come back was certainly two years ago when we originally taped, it was full COVID restrictions. Everybody was in a mask. You could barely interact with anybody keeping your six feet apart. This time, I've said it to other folks, this is a Jeopardy experience that everybody should have. I mean, all 27 of us, you know, we're all champions, no matter what happens on, on this stage. But just to get to know my fellow competitors in this environment to get, again, the full Jeopardy experience was, was just amazing. And we've got a great little text group going, uh, you know, everybody's cheering each other on. It was just an absolute fantastic group. I'm just over the moon with just how much I really, truly enjoyed coming back. Well, that's all swell. But who <laughs> did you size up yes. as the big competition? <laughs> You're going to make me I'm going to make you choose. You? Yeah, I'm going to point. point. <laughs> We're going to set up the lineup. Which Jeopardy. one did it? I, I mean, Lawrence Long certainly w was up there. I knew he's a bright, bright guy and got a lot of different life experiences. And, and honestly, the two folks that I played in the finals, Sam and Lucy, they're both very good players. I knew they would be very challenging. I think the competition speaks for itself in your first quarterfinal game. I mean, you have a come from behind win in this game. And if not for word origins in Final Jeopardy and that feeling of nausea that you said you were feeling, we may not be talking to you right now. This is true. I did not expect to win that game. I mean, I thought immediately when they revealed my answer, I thought, well, you know, it was great. I really enjoyed myself. Steve outplayed me by, by every sense of the word. He was faster on the buzzer. He answered more correct. I fully expected him to get that correct. And it was pretty shocking to me that he didn't. But sometimes once you get your mind on a certain track, you only have 30 seconds. Totally. It is real hard to deviate from that. You know, Brad Rutter once said the most important thing that he thinks for Final Jeopardy is to not get on a track. 
like keep your mind as open as possible for as long as possible. Yeah, that's good advice if you can actually but follow. It's very follow. hard to follow because no matter what, that 30 second clock is ticking in your head, well, the music is playing and you've got to come up with something and even you want to before, go in some direction. Even before the 30 seconds, when, sure. the, when the category pops up, you start trying to imagine what it could be. And that's a very dangerous game. Blind guessing is fun from the couch. Not a good right. idea when you're up yes, there. Yes, much more fun. We head into your semifinal game and here you are with another come from behind win against, I have to say, more strong competition yeah. in Dane Rygaard and Kendra Blanchett. But Dane Rygaard, we knew, nearly defeated Andrew He, who yep. was defeated by Amy Schneider, who goes on to be in Masters. I mean, this is high-level competition. Yeah, Dane and Kendra are both fantastic players, too, and fantastic people. So, again, it was a pleasure to share the stage with them. And, you know, sometimes the categories luck out and you get something right. And for me, it just happened to occur twice in a row, which, you know, is is great. But Dane and Kendra both, I think, outplayed me. It wasn't my strongest game. So I want to go into the psychology here. First of all, congratulations. I'm doing very well in Final Jeopardy, which I have a hard time with. Going into the finals, feeling like you kind of slid through two games with, I don't want to say luck because you played very well, but like not a decisive gameplay. What kind of things were you telling yourself heading into the finals to try to like shake that off or work with that? Well, I mean, certainly going into the finals, going up against Sam and Lucy, I know these are these are top level players. I did my best to sort of maybe tra- change my buzzer strategy just a little bit and maybe anticipating the lights a bit more, trying to get more of a feel for the way Ken was reading the responses relative to what that gap would be when the, the lights were activated. And I felt like I was a little more successful. I haven't seen the stats necessarily for the finals yet, but I felt like I was a little more successful in being able to ring it. I'll give you those stats if you'd like. Sure. <laughs> so we got in your, them right here. In your quarter final game, your buzzer percentage was 44%. In your semifinal game, that went up to 53%. In the first game of the finals, you went up to 55%. And then the second game of the finals fell off a bit to 51%. So statistically, your finals were quite a bit stronger than your quarterfinal and semifinal games. Okay, that's good to get that confirmation. Yes. (laughs) We head into the final of game one. You have a lead and you see the category natural landmarks. You make the biggest wager. You all end up getting it correct, but you do the biggest wager. So that puts you in really good contention heading into day two. What was your mindset or what was your thinking behind that? Oh, I mean, I, I, I go with what Buzzy experienced in the Tournament of Champions, realizing that anybody can win on the second day. You may have a lead. It may be a large lead, but nothing is safe. Anything can happen. So my thought process going into the second day was assuming that Sam bet everything, that we would be tied. Right. As it was, that I had a relatively large wager. It's a pretty good category for me. I had been to Old Faithful. I was, I'm was i familiar with it, and I remember visiting and pulling up, and sometimes you have to wait. But as soon as we got there, it pretty much went off. So it's fresh my mind. So now we're in game two of the finals. At what point do you start to realize you may have locked this thing up? The only part that I remember locking it up was the last daily double. Making sure that I was aggressive enough. It's a relatively good category for me. Wagering enough, doing some quick math, realizing that if I if I wager enough, then I can just take Final Jeopardy out of the second day. And might we add, the only daily double you found in all four of your champion wildcard games. You had to bring that up, Sarah, didn't Well, you? it went well for you. I mean, Buzzy <laughs> likes your wagering with that one. Yeah, I actually wanted to talk to you because you didn't have a chance to show us kind of what your overall strategy and approach for daily doubles were. We saw one of them, but what was your overall feeling on daily doubles? I think ultimately I w- went in with the mindset of finding a daily double. I-, I recall, at least in my original run, I got some flack for being relatively conservative. Probably for me. If I do, <laughs> yeah, if I... If- if I look back, I realize that I was kind of conservative in some spots and maybe a little more aggressive in others. And I feel like I would do my best to try to be more aggressive when I needed to. I didn't get that chance, unfortunately, until the last one I found. But that was sort of the mindset that I had going in. And do you feel like your big wager kind of pushed Sam to wager more? And it kind of reminded me of my game two of the TOC, where I made a big wager and that forced Alan to make maybe a bigger wager than he would have, which he got wrong. And that was kind of the bounce back of the daily double slingshot. Yeah, I feel like I feel like Sam certainly maybe wagered more than he would have ideally liked. Now, I know that Sam, he already had a couple true daily doubles in his previous round. So I know that he can be an aggressive player when he wants to be. 
Um, so I wasn't surprised. I knew he had to go big. And it was unfortunate that he missed that last one. But sometimes that's that's the way the game goes. If I was in his position, I would have done the exact same thing. So if you're doing the math, you came in as a three-day champion. You've essentially now won another four games. So you're kind of stacking yourself as maybe a seven-game champion heading into the tournament of champions. First of all, what's it like to realize... I'm going to the TOC. Sarah, I don't think it's sunk in yet. Really? Uh, honestly. No, I don't think so. No, I was, this was so unexpected. I mean, certainly I've thought about it, but at the same time, it still feels so fresh and unexpected that I honestly can't figure out what the words, how I would put that into actual sentences is. <laughs> Have you looked at the field? Have you taken a, a glance at some of the people that you will be facing in the Tournament of Champions? Oh, I've been watching this past season. I, I know exactly who the strong, there, there's your Chris Panulos, your Ray Lalons of the world. These are these are extraordinary We want you to players. throw a and, name out. This is like a WWE moment where you're like, <laughs> I want Panulo. <laughs> I am not doing that. No. <laughs> but if I were to say that, I, I would say that Chris and Ray are up there. They are top competitors. Ben Chan, he lost by the skin of his teeth on his last final. He could have probably gone twice as many games. These are all fantastic players, and I'm and I'm absolutely thrilled to, to be joining them. So without revealing too much, because, you know, we don't want to give your competition any sort of edge that we don't have to, are you changing up your preparation for the TOC from what you did coming into Champions Wildcard? My Champions Wildcard, my new Jeopardy friends, I, I think they are, uh, they're, they're doing their best to be as supportive as they, as they can, so if we can play a few mock games between now and, and the tournament, I, I think we're going to work towards that. It's shoring up some of the things that I don't know as well that I'd like to be at least passable in, working on maybe a little more buzzer practice mm -hmm. than, than I did before, and just taking in as much as I can for as long as I can. I love that your fellow competitors are gathering and rallying around to help you. To think of Sam and Lucy and everybody championing you is awesome. Oh, these are fantastic. I, I have absolutely loved this group. It is a fantastic group of people. Jeopardy knows how to how to pick you know fantastic contestants and fantastic people. So I am just over the moon with the new friends that I've made. They're the spades, the Buzzy. Spades, I don't know yes. if you know. The first yes. Yes. Champions Wild group, you're the spades. So it's good to know that that is a sweet suit. I was sort of disappointed yeah. that you didn't go for like the tarot, like the cups. And, uh, and yes. But anyway, well, I digress. You know, let's hope we don't ever have to come up with this many competitions <laughs> with this many different ways to identify them. Let's just say that. <laughs> Josh, the softball questions are over. It's time for the gotcha journalism. Oh, yeah. What is your lunch order when you are here on the Sony lot? Buzzy, I was waiting for that question. <laughs> He's anticipating the hard-hitting question. I know. Yeah. I feel like I kind of feel like James Lipton now. What is your <laughs> favorite curse word? I knew when I was doing this, I knew Buzzy would ask me the question when I because we had the the quarterfinals taping. I knew I was taping the second day. I went with some world cuisine the first day because, well, you know, I wanted to have a little bit of Nepalese curry. Risky. Um, really risky. Uh, oh yes. <laughs> oh well, I knew I wasn't playing that. I know, uh, but I, tell you, when I, I was... eat here every day, Josh. It's risky, <laughs> whether you're playing or not. <laughs> yeah, stick get, away from. Yeah. Gastrointestinal distress can last more than 24 hours. <laughs> the next two days, I went with something that I knew was, I mean, a chef salad, I think, one day, and I think I went with a poke bowl the next. Ooh, also very risky. You know, but Ken likes the poke no, bowl. He does. No, and I love a good pokey, but I'm a little... Cafeteria pokey I'm a little hesitant different. at the Sony commissary, but obviously it served you well. <laughs> yeah. You're headed to the TOC on the heels of that pokey, so it's working. It's fantastic to hear. I don't get sick of hearing that. You know, <laughs> next time when you're a TOC champion, I'm going to ask you again, and I hope that you have as good of responses. I bet you say that to all the contestants. I do, it? yeah. I do. <laughs> so next, you, you mentioned that you hadn't seen all the stats yet, but of what you know, is there a stat that you're most proud of? The first day I didn't get any wrong. That's the one I'm most proud of. 100%. Um, unfortunately, I, I feel like I, 100 percent is hard to beat. Yeah. But I mean, I, I feel like my first day I was a little too conservative mm. in my play. Now I kind of balanced that out with some maybe more aggressive tactics that just happened to play out my second day. But I feel like at least in the finals I was able to bring a, a game that was competitive to go against some fantastic players. And ultimately, I ended up successful, and I'm still floored by it. Mm. What's been the reaction of, you know, the people in your life getting to see you back on the Alex Trebek stage and doing so well? 
I feel like I, you know, it's, it, nothing like this happens in a vacuum. My, my family has been thrilled beyond belief, all of my coworkers, all my friends. I feel like this is a community that has really gotten behind me and been, been so supportive. Lots of messages, texts, phone calls. It's been fantastic. So obviously your, your Jeopardy journey is not over. We know we're going to see you in the TOC, but up until this point, what's been the best part so far? Oh, the best part has been meeting my fellow contestants and, again, making my, my new Jeopardy friends and, and meeting all kinds of folks, even though we're from different walks of life, have different occupations. I mean, Jeopardy has brought us together, and we all have kind of the, the trivia itch, if you will, that needs to be scratched from time to time, and, and having that in common really kind of makes your community, and that's just been probably one of the best parts of all this. Well, Josh, we add you to the list of wonderful ambassadors that we're so lucky to have in our Jeopardy family we can't wait to welcome you back for the TOC and enjoy, enjoy this moment, yeah. this unexpected moment. Enjoy it. Oh, I have been, Sarah. I have been. I, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. We'll see you again very soon. Appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Wow, Buzzy, what a great guy that Josh I know. Zach. Don't you just want to hang out with him I, a little longer? I'm like going to the workout with him. I'm excited <laughs> to see him come back and see what he can do in this tournament of champions. You know, last year we saw the first second chance people in the tournament of champions now we're going to have some champions wild card it's really you know these people now have won the number of games that a tournament of champions winner needs to win to qualify so they are really qualified and i'm excited i'm so excited to see what he in particular can do yeah well we're gonna have to wait a little longer for that but next week we will be highlighting more games yes. because we've reached the end of today's show. But don't worry, <laughs> we're going to be back. As I mentioned, we're going to highlight more Champions wildcard games from the Diamonds group and our next celebrity Jeopardy quarterfinal, Oscar winner Mira Sorvino, Adam Rodriguez, and Peter Schrager. So be sure to tune into those games this week and then join us here back on the pod on Monday as we break it all down. And don't forget to post your hashtag Deathly Double Costumes for the chance to win the very exclusive Ken Jennings photograph signed by me, Buzzy Cohen. This is one of only two in existence. And as always, please subscribe to the podcast and follow us at Jeopardy on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, on TikTok, on Twitter, or X, whatever you want to call it. We will see you next week. See you then.
Hey, Ken, what's that thing the kids say? You mean smash the like, subscribe, and bell button so you'll be the first to know when we upload more great videos? Yeah, that's it. Do that.